you go in to get him out. And it's amazing how the world stops in order to get that downed airman out. And uh, there's been two or three pickups where literally the entire air war in Southeast Asia came to a halt in order to get those guys out. Oyster Zero One Bravo. Uh, as Gary said, my name is Ron Smith. I was privileged to be able to fly the A-1 at Nekong Phnom in 1971 and 1972. Uh, a lot of SAR missions uh, during that time. And one of them was Oyster Zero One Bravo, who was the furthest north of any rescue that we had during the war. At the time we started it, uh, we didn't know it was going to be the furthest north, but we kind of got tricked into it. I had a uh, picture that I wanted to show you today, and I did not take into consideration that you can't use one of my thumb drives here. It's a picture of Roger Locker, who was Oyster Zero One Bravo, in the Jolly Green, having just been picked up. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but he looks a hell of a lot better than most of us in this room right now. <laughs> <laughs> he had been on the ground for 23 days at that time, deep inside North Vietnam. Uh, think back to September 7th. How many of you can remember what you were doing that day, much less what you ate that day? He had had nothing but pemmican bars and some berries and the rain water and everything to, uh, to be able to eat. When the picture was taken, we were still deep inside of North Vietnam, and one of the PJs had uh, given him some cookies that his mother had sent. And Roger told me uh, later in life that uh, he ate as many of them as he could. He put the rest of them in his flight suit because he figured we only had about a 50-50 chance of getting out there alive, and he wanted to have something to eat. <laughs> SARS, as uh, uh, you probably can imagine, uh, are all different. There are two elements that are the same, that's the search and then the rescue. Everything else changes with each one of them. Now, this one was no different because it happened after the North Vietnamese had invaded South Vietnam. That was one of the inflection points in the war in, in Vietnam. If you were there and during the time period that a lot of us were, from 71 to 72, if you were there after Easter, it was an entirely different war. Before that, it was back and forth along the uh, PDJ, the Plain de Jars in, in Laos. And the good guys would take part of the ground back and then they'd give it back and it was like that for, for several years. <coughs> On Easter Sunday, the North Vietnamese invaded South Vietnam in three different locations. One of them right across uh, the DMZ, one of them about in the mid-country, and one of them close to, uh, to Saigon. Thousands and thousands of troops, it was like watching a World War II movie. And at that point, there were front lines. We'd never had that before. There were troops in contact all over the place. And the bombing of North Vietnam started again. <coughs> On the 10th of May, the largest strike force that uh, had uh, gone in there at that time uh, went into uh, North Vietnam, and uh, one of the flights that was there was Oyster Zero One. The aircraft commander was uh, Major Bob Lodge, probably the most experienced uh, F-4 pilot in the Air Force, and his backseater was Captain Roger Locker. They had just shot down their third MiG uh, that nobody knew about until after Roger got back, and they got hit. Uh, for reasons we'll never know, uh, Major Lodge went in with the airplane. Roger bailed out, and he hit about 40 miles from Hanoi, northwest of Hanoi. Uh, he hadn't planned on doing that, but he was smart enough to figure out that he wasn't going to get rescued where he was. And he started moving west along our ridge line. And he kept moving for 22 days without calling anyone. Uh, he didn't want them to be able to see or figure out where he was on his radio. He had limited batteries. Who knows? He was having a hard time moving, but he stayed along this ridge line. He was actually moving northwest. On the 22nd day, he figured he couldn't go any further. Uh, he had told me uh, that on one of the first days that he was down, uh, he had a lizard that uh, crawled up along him, and he thought, no, nah, I'm not hungry enough to do that. 
He said he really regretted that later on. <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was still alive and thinking and, and very functional. He called up and the f words that were over here heard him. Uh, at that point, we were flying airborne alert into North Vietnam with two A1s and two Marines in case anybody got shot down. Uh, they called us and said that they had found a survivor. He wasn't anybody that had been flying that day, but they had authenticated him. Now I assume that you guys are still doing the same kind of thing. You've got questions that you have to answer. Uh, a number. Uh, very insecure, but it worked. Uh, the A1 was deceptive in its speed. We were slower than we looked. <laughs> and so we had a lot of time to get to, from where we were up to his location, and we used our best navigation equipment available. We carried one to 250 maps of the entire area, and you pull out the right one and start looking at it to see where you were going to be going. <clears throat> we uh, had a needle that would point in the general direction of somebody transmitting on a UHF radio. It would get you maybe within a few miles if it was working on that day. And then we used our best uh, uh, technique for finding the individual. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? Can you hear me now? Am I overhead now? Roger is mainly responsible for being rescued himself because the things that he did were just unbelievable. First of all, he told us, I'm on a ridge about halfway up, so I knew right away he wasn't in the valley. And number two, he said, I'm watching the MiGs take off from in by. And that didn't give me a real warm feeling. <laughs> but I was hoping that he was south of in by, which was a mountainous area. Uh, so we went up there, left the uh, helicopters and uh, the other uh, A1, my wingman, in the mountains, and I went towards in by to uh, see if I could get him to hear me or see me. Couldn't, uh, couldn't hear me, couldn't see me. He's still telling me that uh, he's on this uh, ridge line. Talk to him. And as I'm passing Yen by, um, they shot a SA-2 and hit one of the two F-4s that we had as our mid-cap. Uh, he managed to make it back to Udorn and they bailed out there, so uh, we didn't have to worry about picking him up. But uh, that, that showed me, okay, that is an active big field and they are not the friendliest in town. And I knew that we had to find him, uh, his location, if we were gonna have any chance of uh, making a plan and getting back there. So I turned out into the valley, uh, crossed the Red River and started heading north, again with my map. And I knew right where I was because I could look up my left wing and there was the runway at, at Yen Bai, about five miles away. And as I'm flying along, all of a sudden it occurred to me, uh, number one, there was this big lake, and it wasn't on the map. And I'm trying to figure out why is that the way it is, because I knew exactly where I was. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, you've been flying straight and level for too long. So I, I broke hard to the left, uh, and people uh, think that I'm making this up, but it's, it's true. The reason I did that is... One of my favorite flying movies is The Battle of Britain. And there is a scene in there where the RAF instructor is teaching the Polish to fly. And he says, never fly straight and level in a combat zone for more than 30 seconds. And that all of a sudden hit me in the head. So I broke to the left, and at about that time, the dam that was on the other end of the lake lights up, and there are all these little white puffy clouds right where I would have been if I hadn't broken to the left. So now, now I know that the MiGs are active in Yen Bai. They've got SAMs there and their guns along this uh, dam and he hasn't heard or seen me yet. So we weren't going to make a pickup that day. So we headed back to NKP. Again, the, the A1 is slow enough, so plenty of time to make a plan on my way back. Um, the helicopter uh, aircraft commander was then Captain Dale Stovall, who I flown with before. And he was convinced that we could do it. We went to the wing commander, they went to the 7th Air Force, and we said there's only three things that we need. We need a flight of F-4s to crater the runway at Yen Bai. We need a flight of F-4s to take out the guns. And we need a MiGcap. Those were not easy things to arrange. 
they were not allowed to destroy the dam because that would have been against the rules. So they can only take out the guns. Uh, they didn't want us to hit Yen Bai because there were Chinese there. And we had an agreement with the Chinese for 90 days. We didn't get any uh, big fields. That all got approved. And uh, nothing against uh, any F-4 pilots in here. But we used to joke about the accuracy or inaccuracy of the F-4s. You guys don't know probably what a dumb bomb is. But we were just getting to smart laser guided bombs uh, at that point. And uh, so we joke about the fact that the F-4s from even a mile off of target or something. But they had to hit this runway. The idea was the next day we went up four A1s and two Jollies. Um, the Kingbird, which was a HC-130, which was there to refuel the Jollies. We had our flight of mid-cap. Uh, we had uh, the flight that was going to hit the runway at exactly the time we were crossing into uh, the Red River Valley. Best strike I've ever seen. Uh, as we were crossing the river, my wingman and I, you could look off your left shoulder and they cratered the runway about a third of the way down. Exactly. Couldn't have been any better. Whether they were using smart bombs or not, I don't care. I was taking my wingman up to show him where everything was so in case anything happened to me, he could take over. So we started heading towards the uh, the dam, figuring they were going to start shooting at us, and they did. And as we're uh, jinking the, to get back, Roger called and he said, I'm on the other side of where they're shooting at you. Well, that confirmed to me that I knew exactly where he was. And I asked the F-4 uh, flight lead, I said, do you need me to turn around and make a run uh, with a marking rock, rocket on the, uh, on the dam? Thank God he said no. He said, I'm not having any trouble seeing where we're shooting at. So as we uh, egressed, we told Roger, get ready. You're not going to see us or hear us. I want you to get your smoke ready. Day in and night in on one and your mirror. Now, I don't know what you guys have now for uh, survival equipment. We thought ours was pretty good. But it would show the, the location of anybody on the ground, not only to us, but to anybody that was on the ground looking for him, too. The exception was the only thing in Europe. It was great. And it happened to be a nice sunny day. That's like only practice. And uh, when you see this, you turn down and push the one that you see. We had asked uh, some of the uh, F-105 pilots who were at NKP, where did you guys go across the Red River in order to get to Thud Ridge? And so I planned for us to go up there and go across the river and come in from the north side to pick him up. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, he hit my wingman with that mirror he had been practicing for those 30 or 40 minutes that we were going. And just couldn't have been uh, any better as far as him uh, hitting the, the thing. The Jollies came in, they picked him up. Uh, Dale had told his, uh, his PJs, if you look down there and you see more than one person, kill them both and tell us to get out of here. <laughs> Dale was never as convinced as I was that it was the right guy that <laughs> was down there. We brought him up and as I said, he uh, had his uh, picture taken on the, on the way back. We uh, came back out the same way we went in, which probably wasn't my best decision. Uh, as we crossed the river again, there's a railroad track that went into China. And there was a freight train parked on it, and we couldn't stop at that point. So as we went across and tried to keep their heads down, uh, my number three and four uh, Sandys made passes on the train. Uh, Jim ended here, so I shouldn't talk about him uh, like this, but he didn't make one pass. He kept going until he got the engine to explode. Uh, we got uh, trailed by a couple of flights of MiGs on our way out. Uh, they never attacked. I joked with uh, and our, our MiG cap, by the way, had gone to the tanker, and so we didn't have any cap at the time. And uh, as they were coming off the tanker, I joked with them and I said, you better get here fast because we're going to really embarrass you if we shoot down a MiG. <laughs> uh, we got Roger back to Udorn. A uh, couple of, of, uh, of things to think about. Number one, I know there's a lot of talk now about 
whether combat SAR is even going to be viable in the future. In the in the My personal feeling is the world isn't uniform. There are places that you're always going to be able to pull people out, and there are places you're not going to be able to pull people out. But those places that you can are probably going to shrink down a bit. I can tell you, I don't think there was anything that we did in the entire year I was over there that was a morale boost as much as going that far north and getting Roger back. Um, everyone thought at that point, if I go down, they're going to find me. Uh, Randy, I'll probably give you some stats on this in a minute, but basically, 40% uh, you know, of the guys that hit the ground in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, we got out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that includes uh, North Vietnam. Uh, only about half of them got out of the airplanes. So, you know, depends on how you want to be the master story. Uh, like I said, I have a privilege to, to be there and to be at uh, the right spot. Um, we haven't seen any of these old guys raising their hands, which means I haven't played too many lot. Like, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them.